<laughs> right, here we are again. Well, I'll start again. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I, uh, I was saying I can't promise that we won't touch on the subject of coronavirus because the great thing about Mike's book, Spirit of Cricket, is that he places the issue of the spirit in which cricket is played within this wider context of all sorts of other themes and ways of looking at it than just simply the cricket field. It's a terrific book. I've read it three times now, I think, and uh, I find new things each time I read it. So um, I'm really looking forward to talking to Mike and having this discussion now. I won't introduce Mike too formally. I think everybody knows who Mike is, a very distinguished cricket captain of England and in subsequent life, a very distinguished psychoanalyst as well. So good afternoon to you, Mike. Hello, Stephen. Thank you. And I, I just before we before you ask me anything, I just want to say thank you for, to you for your help with the book. Not, it, Stephen's read it three three times, partly because he was reading it for me. And and giving um, actually, if you read the book, you'll see there are uh, some references to him. But some of his ideas also percolated through more generally. So I'm very grateful. And oh, thank out. you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, let's start right back in the year 2000 when MCC felt it was necessary to add to the laws of the game this preamble about the spirit of cricket, um, as if the laws weren't sufficient to deal with some of the matters that were happening in the game. Um, do you think the game had changed? significantly to force them to do that uh, what's your feeling about what caused that to happen in the first place um, the the bit of official answer i got from ted dexter because he said that he and colin cowdery as ex-presidents and committee members of mcc <clears throat> saw from reports that came in from mcc out matches and matches against schools and other or, you know, groups and teams and organizations that there were more and more complaints about the behavior or comments on uh, behavior that seemed unacceptable you know snatching the sweater snatching the hat cap uh, back from the umpire complaining about the umpire swearing i don't know that sort of um coarsening perhaps of the behavior of the game and they thought um, they wanted to do something about it. And so I, I think that's, that's where it came. Now the question, how much had changed or what had changed is a, is a kind of complicated question, which uh, some, someone else has come up on my screen. Well, no, we're all right again now. Yep. Okay, yes, um, which, which you and I talked about or exchanged views on a little bit about post-war views, you know, the, the, the the relief at the end of the war, the values, um, some of them religious, but not only religious, uh, the empire still being in place, uh, the world coming back to normal after six years of the war. Six years, and we've only had a year of COVID, haven't we? This is pretty shocking. But, um, and, and the way in which um, commercialism had perhaps become the more worrying aspect of the game as opposed to class attitudes, you know, and, and the structures of empire and the public schools and, and, and I don't, nothing against public schools. Well, I have, but not against the people who are from them or the system, you know, it's the, it's the fact that they're, well, that's a complicated question. I won't go into that anymore. But I, so I think that, that in the aim to get results and um, to get what one wants more quickly and in the openness of the British and others to being more expressive of their feelings, I think things did change, some of them for the better, but some of them for the worse. And I think that's what lay behind probably the, the, that move in 2000 to have a preamble to the laws. Yes. Now you could, you've got a sentence in the book. I wonder if you could explain what you mean by this. I, I can't remember if it's a quote or you're saying it. We play to win, but we don't play in order to win. Yes, I think that was a quote from 
Was it from Keith Andrew? I can't quite remember. No, it's not from Keith Andrew. It's not from Keith Andrew. Was it's similar to something he said, yes. I can't remember who it was just offhand. We could look it up, but I can't yes. remember. <laughs> Somebody did. But um, uh, the nature of the, the yes. role of winning in cricket. Yes. Well, we are competitive. We need competitors to bring the best out of ourselves, to challenge ourselves, to improve our play. The game games of sports are set up to be competitive. It's part of their essence, um, in which they're somewhat different from something like dance, let's say, or gymnastics. Uh, gymnastics can be, of course, for competition. Um, and it seems to me that there's nothing wrong with trying hard to win. In fact, sometimes, as I have a part of a chapter in the book, it's not a good thing uh, not to try to win. And it's certainly a very bad thing to try not to win <laughs> for, for various um, devious and financial motives. Um, so I think that although some people may say it's a mark of immaturity to be so keen on doing something that involves winning and losing, and although there are dangers in over-competitiveness, as we know, um, it's nevertheless, it can be a, a failing in a person's character and personality not to be flat out to win. Or, I don't mean at any cost. I mean, but wanting to win, trying hard, one's hardest to win or to do well, and accepting then victory and defeat without gloating or uh, grievance. Yes. Now, I think the nub of this whole discussion, in a way, comes down to the extent to which you can put everything in a set of laws. Yes. Or whether there's something beyond the laws that you need to enforce yeah. and that you can't enforce just by legislating at every point. You have to appeal to something beyond the laws to say yeah. that's not in the spirit of the game to do it like that. I mean, that reminds me of what the government's trying to do now with the chief medical officer. He's trying to say, he's trying to say to people, look, this is a serious situation. You have to be uh, absolutely, you have to think every time you go out that you might be carrying the virus or you might get it. Every time you encounter anyone else, that might happen and that might end up with a vulnerable person who's going to die or be seriously, seriously ill. So I suppose that, uh, yes, I think there's always something beyond any laws. And it's to do with collegiality, it's to do with um, moral values, it's to do with um, respecting other people, it's to do with playing hard but fair, you know, uh, recognizing that people make mistakes, that you can't be perfect. It, it's, it's also the whole question of of bringing on together the tensions of passion and reasonability, you know, control and spontaneity, expression and uh, self-control. When all those things in life, that they're, they're true in how one relates to one's wife or one's children or one's colleagues and friends and or it, they, across the board, they, they function and they certainly function in sport. And one of the examples you gave in the book is you wanted to make a contrast between two situations, one of which you felt was within the spirit and one of which you felt wasn't. Yes. One was, and they both involved the last ball of a, a limited over game when, with the fielding team. And in one case, you were the captain and I think the team needed three to win. Yes. And you yes. put every man on the boundary. Including the wicketkeeper. Yes. And the other was... Trevor Chappell bowling, rolling the ball down the wicket at the batsman when he needed yeah. six to win. Neither yeah. were not in, in, neither were illegal in terms of the laws. No, right. <coughs> and they were both in that grey area where one might say, well, that's fine. And somebody yeah. else might say that's not in the spirit of the game to do that. Uh, somebody else might try to differentiate. Yes. <laughs> Maybe self-interestedly. <laughs> but but actually, uh, I, I I don't think I, I still don't think that. Although of course it may be so, and other people would have to decide. And I think there's something about um, not um, going so far as to remove the possibility of skill of the other side doing something. 
um, but making it as hard for them as you possibly can. Because um, uh, rolling the ball on the ground meant that uh, you, you, you simply couldn't hit a six. I mean, you just, there was no way you could. You probably couldn't hit a four either, but you probably couldn't do anything much. But um, uh, whereas putting the wicket keeper on the boundary as well as the other nine, and I think in those days, almost anyone would have put all nine fielders on or near the boundary on a big field because you could hopefully stop them scoring three. Though I've got another story about that, by the way, which yes. Mike Selby reminded me of. That we were playing, Middlesex were playing Lancashire at Old Trafford, and the pitch was far away from the pavilion. And for some reason, the last ball was bowled by Wayne Daniel, and they needed three to win, he told me. And I vaguely remember it. And uh, Alan Arthur Jones, A.A. A. Jones, and it couldn't have been Wayne Daniel because they didn't, oh no, it could have been, probably was um, 1977 or something, or eight. And uh, I had, a made a mistake because I got Alan Jones, Arthur Jones, on the longest boundary. And sure enough, the ball went towards somewhere near to Alan Arthur Jones, who had to field the ball. He managed to field it. He was our worst fielder. He managed to pick the ball up without fumbling it. He thought of hurling it in, but he might have, it might have gone anywhere if he'd hurled it in. And he thought if he ran towards the stumps, he could... Um, probably get there or get very close to there before they completed uh, three runs. Or, uh, and and um, he also may have noticed that the man beside the bowler's stumps was Wayne Daniel, who was probably our second uh, most <laughs> safe pair of hands in a crisis, to put it that way in terms of feeling. So he set off at a sort of speedy trot towards the, the wickets and the batsmen were herring up and down you see and he eventually got sort of 20, 30 or 40 yards away 20 or 30 yards away and he decided he might not get there in time and he thought the best and safest way to throw the ball was to throw it underarm but it got stuck in his hand and went straight up in the air and <laughs> I, I think the outcome was that we still won the match but I can't quite be sure. Mike self remember. <laughs> well, <laughs> on the whole, a... you'd think if you put nine fielders on the on the boundary, they wouldn't get three runs by running between the wickets. They might hit a four or six, but they wouldn't do that. Um, and the wicketkeeper just um, made it less likely that they'd get it off buys or leg buys, you know, or, or a very, very thin edge. And I actually, uh, interestingly, I'd it came to me to do that because I remembered Mike Smith, MJK Smith, having done it for Warwickshire against Middlesex, either the season before or the season before that. And I'd thought, yeah, that's a good idea. What a, what, what a shrewd thing to do. And they had won the match too. So I thought it was fair enough. And I must say there were no, as you say, no rules or laws or condition, playing conditions against it. Yes. There it is a grey. There are bound to be grey areas in this, and there may not be a simple answer in many cases. I mean, walking is the case in point, in my view. Yes. You know, the, uh, when you started playing cricket, um, was it understood that you walked by everybody you played with? I think it pretty much was, yes. I think at school it probably was. I think in club cricket it probably was, and, and certainly in county cricket. It was that was it was considered bad form or close to cheating not to walk. Now, occasionally that itself could lead to difficulties, partly because some people didn't always walk, as I confess to, I'm afraid, in my book. Uh, but some people would walk when they were on, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know 38 or 103, but not on naught or 99. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and some people. Um, and what's more, sometimes the fielding side would get convinced that you'd hit the ball and you hadn't walked and accuse you of cheating and you hadn't hit the ball or you were absolutely sure you hadn't hit the ball. And I think 99% of the time you know, know whether you've hit the ball or not. So and then and then that would mount because the fielding side would uh, accuse you of cheating, would start cheating back. The umpire, they would also, uh, umpires would would be accused of being incompetent or even biased occasionally. So I, you know, I, there are ramifications of walking 
that whereas the simplicity of not walking or the Australian method of waiting for a decision, uh, taking the rough with the smooth, marching off when you're given out, whether you're out or not, getting on to bowl the next ball if, if the batsman has nicked it. See, I think there's perfectly good reason for that system, which is actually more or less the system in, in, in test cricket when I started to encounter it or play in it. So you, you played in the years where walking started to die out, didn't you? Well, it started to get less, less systematic, yes. I think it did. Um, and that's probably the least satisfactory time. You know, it, it, it's, it's fine if, if the culture is fairly uniform that you walk. And it's also fine if the culture is uniform that you don't walk. It's when they meet each other that, and, the, and these cultural difficulties, which may be just more or less different cultural fashions rather than absolute right and wrong, uh, that's when the uh, unease comes in. And, and, the, yes. and the hostility and the, uh, and the, and the uh, accusations of cheating and so forth. Now what is it about cricket? Because this phrase, it's not cricket, that people have used to use a lot. They don't use it so much now. I don't know if that's because cricket doesn't have that image or cricket, it just simply isn't that popular anymore. But when we were young, people used to say it's not cricket about all sorts of things, as though cricket was a byword for good manners and fair play. Yes. Um, is, yes. in, in, in the book, you at points come close to saying that that was rather pompous yes. and pretentious. Uh, uh, but I think also as you the book goes on, I think you come to the view that there's a bit more to it than that. And the, yes, I do, I do. It can be uh, pompous and pretentious and, uh, you know, like, like um, thinking of cricket and the spirit of cricket as a sort of arm of empire, you know, the, and this is a, the great culmination of Anglo-Saxon values and these uh, strange foreigners will not appreciate it and we have to teach them the right and wrong, you know, that sort of, uh, which is more or less what was said by a, a Barbasian writer whom I quote in the book, I think he's called, I can't remember his first name, Sandiford or Sandford, anyway. Oh yes, Keith Sanderford, I think, yes. Yes, he, he, he's quoted as saying that it was, cricket was considered to be, by the British to be um, the epitome of Anglo-Saxon of Anglo superiority over all the other races and, and, and people in the world, you know, and, and he found it extremely patronising and colonial, which it was, well, it was certainly, probably both. And, it, and the difficulty of that is that it, it, it's top down. You know, we're the superior ones and you're the inferior ones. And whereas I like to think of the spirit of cricket or cricket spirit as being something that's sh shared by everyone, not in all its detail, but in the fact of its being there. The people who play on a May down in India or on a back street in Yorkshire or uh, I don't know, anywhere in the world uh, have their shared values about how you play the game and what's fair and what isn't fair and where the lines roughly are to be drawn. Of course, they have their disputes because there are gray areas and because there are different uh, reactions to those gray areas. Um, so uh, I can't quite remember how, what was the question to start with? Oh yes, so um, that's one thing I think that um, the spirit of cricket can be a democratic thing. I quote, I think he was the, uh, Lord Chief Justice, uh, or the head lawyer of England, Bingham, Tom Bingham. Oh, yes. Saying, saying of uh, Runny, what happened at Runnymede? The yeah, Magna Carta. Yes. That it was an expression of the views of the people, or at least of the views of the articulate representatives of the people. So in other words, it could only happen, which was a very important, huge step that you can't just... Uh, you know, the king is not above the law. No one is above the law. And you have no right to, to harm someone or imprison them or take away their life or torture them uh, unless you've um, got good cause for it. I mean, I'm not saying you've got cause, good cause yeah. for those, in, in the fashions and uh, values of the day. And, and it was a huge step. And it, it could only have happened if there was a sense of fair play 
amongst people, you know, about justice or a sense of justice. And, and that fair play, whether it's about justice in general or about fair play on the cricket field or any other field. So that's the second thing, that there is a sense of fair play. But then there's a the question of cricket as opposed to other sports. And that, as, as I say in the book, you, you wouldn't know what somebody meant if they said it's not tennis or it's not football. I think that you uh, helped me a bit with the notion of golf, actually, which had an etiquette uh, for cricket and now has a, pre uh, for golf, and now has a preamble to the rules of golf, or the, uh, 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 which is a similar thing. Uh, and indeed in golf, there aren't umpires usually, and how you deal with your ball in the rough or a lost ball or a ball in the water and how you drop it and what you do with its lie. They're all things that people do almost always privately, you know, out of sight of the world. And so it's a very important thing that there's an honor amongst golfers that you don't change the lie of the ball, you know, or you, or you, or you, you, you take a penalty stroke and you drop it and you take it from where it's dropped, whatever the exact detail is. So I think golf, as you said to me, or we said to each other was, is a, a game of individual moments and episodes like cricket with gaps in between and takes a lot of time. And I think it gives you time for reflection. It's not quite like a hundred meter race or a, not that there's much chance for cheating in that or a, <laughs> or a game of rugby or football, you know, uh, which is so quick and hectic and impassioned, physical, uh, that I think there's uh, less space for reflection in the course of the activity. And the game goes on for such a long time. So that's just another thing. And I think that um, the fact that it was, that it involves cricket and batting anyway, involves loss such that you have to leave the field, sometimes for long periods of time. And sometimes when you've hardly started doing what you came out to do, which is totally different from football. I'm not talking about substitutions. I'm talking about the game between 11 aside or, for, or 15 aside where, you know, if you're doing badly, you have to stay out there. Whereas in cricket, you make one mistake or you get one good ball and you can be off the field for two days or whatever it is. Yes. That coping with loss in the context of a game in which there's each individual event is between two protagonists, but in the context of a team game, I think it brings so much more in about the group and the individual, individual aspiration and team aspiration playing for the side as well as playing for yourself, all of those things enter into cricket. And if one can manage to integrate them and deal with the conflicts that they ne inevitably involve at times or the tensions, I think maybe there's something that can rise above, uh, can rise above narcissism or self-seeking. In that sense, would, would you be comfortable with the statement that playing cricket um, is good for your character, is character developing and makes you a better person? One of, one of my colleagues in the England team, whom I knew also from county cricket, playing against him, said of a player in, in his team who'd been on the staff of that county for 15 years, that he, that he had grown in the game uh, to learn nothing that he didn't know before, technically or emotionally. <laughs> or in terms of spirit or, you know, in other words, it, it depends on you. But I think cricket does and can offer, you know, nudges, reminders, values that do help one to grow up a bit or help the process. I don't think we should idealize it. I don't think we should expect too much. Expect, hope for, aspire to, but not expect too much. And I do quite like that phrase, a will of the, you know, the spirit of cricket, somebody said, will, is, a, is a will of the wisp situated three or four miles above the pavilion at Lords, as a sign of lofty, cloudy <laughs> aspiration. And of course, if it's, if it's like a bubble, it can get pricked and it can sink to the ground, you know? So I think, it, too high an aspiration or too woolly an aspiration or too sentimental an aspiration, all of which are sometimes the case, 
uh, can be uh, not a good thing.